This week, we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. They're being test flown and uh, basically just analyzed. What was your function of working on this? You were doing what? What was your job? We were to reverse engineer the power and propulsion system of this craft and see if it can be duplicated with available materials. I just want to go over with you what it is that you saw to draw it out for people, to make a sketch. As you're seeing it, as if you're there at that moment, kind of go back in the past. It takes different views to show you different places. I'll draw you what the craft essentially looked like. I haven't done this in a really long time. I mean, it had the classic, most of it the classic shape. However, That didn't come out that bad this time. So basically, that's the shape of the craft. That's the thing I termed the sport model. Underneath this floor, there are three, three large centrical devices hanging from the floor. These are on mounts that allow them to completely swivel up to 180 degrees and in 360 degree rotation. Directly above each one is a small rectangular object. This is on the floor above. And these are the gravity amplifiers themselves. Looking down from the top, you'd have the center. In the very center, there is a small reactor. Surrounding this in three equally spaced areas are the amplifiers. So this is looking at it sideways. This is looking at it down from the top. And under these amplifiers, underneath, on the floor below, are the gravity emitters. So it's the reactor here powering the gravity amplifiers. Gravity amplifiers output goes into the gravity emitters at the bottom. And the resulting gravity beam or anti-gravity wave can be pretty much put anywhere you want to. Um, there was another level up here. Now I had access and was permitted to view and look at the operation of this main level with the gravity amplifiers and the level below uh, the gravity emitters. There is a level above which consisted of these two areas that I'm not all that familiar with. I assume these to be some sort of navigational engine. Uh, people call these large black rectangular areas on the top portholes. I believe they were some planar sensor array that just took in information from the surrounding area, whether it be patterns of stars or what have you. Uh, and there was their version of a computer or something to make determinations here that takes input from those sensors and then let the craft know how to orient itself and where it was in space. So that's what I assumed to be up there. I don't know for a fact. Again, that was not part of my job and I was only led to believe that. The center antenna is really an extension of the reactor in the center. And that's a waveguide, which allows the, uh, the emission of the gravity wave, which forms kind of a heart shape over the whole, the whole craft. That's how it creates its distortion. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees. And this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover 
while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it, allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three. And unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination. The three amplifiers focus in on the destination, and that's how it proceeds. So that's basically the operation of it and overall how things were laid out inside the craft. There were three seats in here, and uh, just around the, uh, uh, the reactor. There are no controls, no buttons, no anything. Everything has a nice smooth curve to it. There are no right angles anywhere. Everything is exactly the same color. And uh, whether it's metal or some other advanced material, I don't know, again, that was part of the metallurgy division. And uh, all I can say is it felt cold like metal, um, but it's actual composition. Who knows if it was ceramic or, you know, again, some advanced alloy or something along those lines. But uh, the manufacturing technique is unknown and certainly was back then. Um, today, 30 years later, there are things like 3D printing and now that kind of begins to make sense because it looks like this craft was just built from the ground up like a 3D printer. And that would be about the only way to produce some of the things we saw because there were no fasteners anywhere. It was just all together, not even a seam. So, um, I don't know. How that was actually assembled is a good question, but I bet it was something along those lines, some gigantic printing mechanism or something we would consider a printing mechanism that actually put this together. When you were allowed to go into the middle and look down into the bottom layer of this craft, what did it feel like to step in? Like, was it instantaneously obvious to you that we could not make this? upon walking in the craft? Yeah, it was really, and pardon the pun, it was really unworldly. Everything, <laughs> again, was alien. It really was. In that, uh, again, nothing is always completely monochrome in things people build. There's always seams. There's always something other than a radius of curvature. There's a sharp edge. There's some kind of control. Everything was different. There wasn't even wires in this thing as we started to dismantle it. But um, it was more of an ominous feeling because we really didn't know what we were getting into, how dangerous it was, and certainly didn't know how dangerous it was to remove anything or change it. Look, I mean, we have energy sources this day and age. You can't just remove caps, you know, off of reactors and have a peek inside and see what's going on. And we really didn't understand the energy source. We had no idea what, you know, a housing might be holding back. So it was fearsome technology, as I've said before. And, uh, you know, so was it exciting going inside? Not exciting in that way. It was exciting because we were afraid. Uh, and really just looked around inside. The reason for going in was to have a look. There was a little access port here where you could push it open and stick the top half of your body in, hang upside down and look and see the orientation and how the gravity emitters were hanging from the, you know, the floor above. What was your first indication that it was not human? It was not ours. It was not made for us. Well, certainly the size. I mean, this is only about little over 50 feet in diameter. The only time you could ever stand up would be the middle. So <laughs> nobody would make something like this. It was extremely uncomfortable to move around in. The seats were not for full-size humans. Everything looked like it was child size. And the access port I couldn't dream of getting through. So there was certainly something smaller operating this. The opening port was like a, 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 hexagon, a hexagon honeycomb with an edge cut out. And if you grabbed the edge and just pushed a little bit, the honeycombs would all collapse, some sort of flexible metal, and all snap open. And I remember seeing or saying to myself, that's 
that's something we could make today. That that's really because it has a lot of strength standing on it, but no strength the other way. So you can pop it open, use it as an access port, snap it closed, and it would support weight on it. Uh, something very simple. Not that it really stood out. I was standing in a ocean of alien technology, but I think the reason it stood out was there's something I understand, you know, and nothing. I, I don't understand anything else. So I kind of grabbed onto that. It's like, I, I see what you did, guys. Here, not anywhere else. Um, so the other fascinating thing was um, it was essentially a pipe. I mean, if you want to just give you analogies, these gravity emitters look like 55 gallon drums and a big, oh, I'd say four inch diameter pipe, oh, maybe 10 inches long, can, maybe a little longer, connected the top of the drum to the floor above. It's a solid, thick pipe. Somehow, they were able to manipulate the structure of that pipe where it would just bend as if it was made of clay. So they can apply some form of control to it and have a solid piece of pipe move like a tentacle. So they can get very fine movements and adjust and point these things wherever they were and then stop stimulating the stuff and they were locked in place like it was welded on there with a giant pipe. How do you know that they could bend these pipes that way? We did, we had one of these setups in the lab when you had made adjustments, it would move, it would bend? Yes. That is putting out a gravity wave. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we bench tested this setup, uh, yeah, it worked. You know, you've got these seats, no seat belts, and then it goes belly facing where it's supposed to go. How did the occupants you know, not fall out of the seats? What's that about? Well, you're thinking about flying around a single source of gravity below you, and then as you move around, you'll flop, but you're canceling out gravity from every, anywhere else. You're canceling out gravity, inertia, and all other effects. And the only gravity there's going to be is the center is probably going to be the reactor itself. So you're always just pulled and held to the floor here. That's always the ground. So, so no matter how you're oriented, this is always where your pull is. So you'd never even know that you're upside down you know, in relation to the earth or other things. It creates this field around you, almost heart-shaped, and then that kind of is a cocoon of what we'd call gravity, and it holds you so you can just be inside of that field, and then wherever you end up focusing, that's where you're going to fall to. Right. That's the propulsion. Okay. Now, of course, we never, at least I never had information of us flying the craft at that performance level, but it's assumed that's how it works from the information we, we gleaned. But you saw this craft. Oh, I saw this craft and these work. And you can certainly extrapolate if three of them together worked like this first one, we know how it, how it operated. So there's, you know, extremely high confidence in that. And the craft that you're drawing here is the one that you guys would take parts out of and work on. Yes. Is it also the one that you saw the test of? Yes. So they were able to take parts out and put them back in. That's no, 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 no. They did not. This flew on two amplifiers. This was already removed. I mean, I should put a dotted line around here. This was on the bench in our room. When I went in there, this was already out. And it still worked. I, I can't imagine how they made the decision to remove that. I'm really glad I wasn't there. At some point you were inside and it was activated and something happened to the inside of the wall. I guess that is an important part. The other, to explain that, around the wall, it was essentially a, a set of archways which were extruded from the wall all around. And we later found these out to be I guess this is a big thing I should touch on. Uh, we found these to be waveguides. And this is how the gravity field was being manipulated. It almost looked like it was just a design element, but it was, it became very obvious that nothing here uh, was done for aesthetics. Everything had a functional purpose. And, you know, even in our spacecraft, everything has pretty much a functional purpose. There are no house plants or anything just to look at there. But these archways 
were extruded from the base wall. And for the most part, it seemed they were all the same. But in fact, they were not. One of them, and just putting this here, so they looked like this all the way around. One of them was different. And the one time I was in there, there were other people also working on there in their own particular group. They activated this by some means. And we could see from inside, we could see right through that. I guess the modern day analogy would be a electrochromatic glass where it's normally opaque, some energy is applied to it and it becomes transparent. And whatever the other group was doing, this panel here underneath this archway became transparent and we can see the, the hanger outside. They also did something else and we can see something, the only thing I can relate it to is some sort of writing, some kind of symbols like that. I'm assuming that's some sort of written written language. I, I really don't know. That's That's a guess on my part. But there were symbols that were displayed here and then it went back to looking outside. So somebody had a handle on how to control what was going on without any wires or switches. So that was kind of good to see some, somebody was making some progress somewhere. Again, we weren't even permitted information about that and I was fortunate enough just to see it. So um, now is it possible these other archways uh, did something too? Uh, it could be. I didn't see it, but I know this one, this particular one did. This is an alien spacecraft. Right, right, obviously. Another entity had to make this. Right. Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Things are not what they seem. Everything around us is a mental construct. We create our own reality. Breaking that down is hard to do. And once it's done, there ain't no coming back. <laughs>